All right, welcome to Unit 3. In Unit 3, what we're going to take a look at is we are going to start taking a look at how to design a study um, and experiments, and we're going to take a look at how we can design these studies in order to make sure that they are effective and that we can make inferences about the larger population. All right, so today we're just going to do an introduction to samples and surveys, and when, before you even begin a study, you want to make sure that you take a sample that is a good representation of the population, and in this section, that's what we're going to take a look at. Okay, so what you're going to be able to do at the end of the section is understand the population and the sample that you're looking at within a sample survey, understand the difference between a voluntary response sample and a convenient sample, describe how to use a table of random digits to select a simple random sample, an SRS, uh, describe how simple random samples, stratified random samples, and cluster samples are all different, and then explain how under coverage, non-response, and question wording can lead to bias in a sample survey. So this section is a lot of big vocabulary. It's really important that you understand the vocabulary in this section, uh, especially because we'll be getting into later sections. We'll be doing experiments, and you don't want to misuse the vocabulary from this section in experiments. All right, so hopefully at the end of this unit, you're going to be able to answer some of the questions or design a study how to answer some of these questions. So basically, there's a lot of studies done out there. Do students learn better when they're listening to music or in silence? Um, back in the day, everybody listened in silence, and now everybody's listening to their iPods. So has there been a change in students' knowledge? Uh, do SAT scores really go up if you attend a six-week SAT seminar? So if your parents pay for that six-week SAT seminar, was it worth it? Do students learn better um, when they're sitting in rows or in a horseshoe pattern? Um, do students learn better if school starts at 7.30 or 9? So I don't know, some of you are the high schoolers that have had that change. Do you do better later or earlier? And would students in elementary schools learn better if they had to have a chance to have a morning snack? Um, actually, would high school students learn better if you had the opportunity to have a morning snack? So this section is just going to take a look at how we would sort of start answering these questions. And in order to start answering these questions, we have to make sure that we have a sample that is a good representation of the population in question. Okay, number one, um, make sure you understand the difference between a population and a sample. So it's very basic, but a population in a statistical study is the entire group of individuals for which we want information. The population doesn't have to always be like the whole United States, the whole world. You're going to define the population for what you want it to be. So what do you specifically want to look at? So if you're doing a study to see whether or not high schoolers learn better at 7.30 or 9.30, maybe you would define the population to be all of the high schoolers in the United States. That might be too challenging. So maybe we're just specific, specifically looking at Fairfax County. So you would say, okay, maybe it's we're just taking a look at the population of high school students in Fairfax County. Now what a sample is, is it's part of that population. So it's often unrealistic, time consuming, and expensive to take a to get a poll of the entire population. So we use a sample that is a good representation of the population. And from this sample, we draw conclusions about the entire population that we have defined. Okay, so basically what it is we have our sample, we defined our population to be all students in, or sorry, population to be all students in Fairfax County. We take a sample of that, all right, we get a sample, collect the data from it, where there's were their GPAs better or worse after the later start, and then or the same, and then we make an inference about the population. So we use the sample basically to come up with a conclusion that's representation of the whole population. All right, just remember that the population is the group of individuals that we want to know about. You'll often hear it called the popula population of interest. Well, that makes sense. It's the population that you're interested in. This does not necessarily mean that it's the population we can make inferences about. So just because we have a population of interest that we want to find information about, it doesn't necessarily mean that even after we gather a sample that it's a population that we can come to conclusions about. Well, why is that? Okay, so for example, when we take a sample, we want to make sure every individual that's in our population is eligible to be chosen for the sample. 
For example, if there were individuals that were not eligible for our sample, then we cannot make we cannot include them as part of our population. We cannot also make inferences about them. All right, let's say we're doing a phone survey and we decide that the population of interest is going to be everybody in McLean. Well, if there are individuals that do not have a telephone or don't have a landline, these individuals are not eligible in order to make inferences about because I couldn't even get them in they weren't even a possibility to be part of my sample. So just keep that in mind. All right, so what I'd like you to do is take a look at questions A, B, and C. Um, take a look and I want you to figure out what the population of interest is. Now, we're gonna be taking a look at what kind of individuals the population consists of and what individuals fall within that population. So if the information is not complete. Just take a minute and make a complete description of the population. So you're describing the population, what kind of individuals are in it, and if it's not complete, complete the population. Okay, so let's take a minute and take a look at the next slide and see what our population was and um, what individuals are in it. All right, so for the first one for the Gallup poll, um, hopefully you've heard of it before, but the Gallup population is all the United States adult residents, but their sample is just the 1,500 adults who actually respond to the survey questions. For the second question, the population was all of the households in the United States, and the sample, that was the 17% that responded to the long form of the survey. In letter C, the population was all the voltage regulators from the supplier, and then the sample was just the five that went out to be tested. So just like I said, keep in mind that the population can differ from question to question, and we can define what the population um, is that we want it to be making inferences about. All right, so let's just take a look at an idea of a sample survey. So we've taken a sample of the, you know, 17% of the adults in the United States. We've taken 1,500 United States adults for the Gallup poll. What is a sample survey? What makes it good? What makes it bad? And how, what can we do to make it the best representation possible um, for our population? So what our goal is, we often draw conclusions about a whole population based on a sample. All right, so let's say you go to Ben and Jerry's, you're hungry, um, and you take one bite of their I forget, their monkey ice cream, right? So one bite of that monkey ice cream is a good representation of the ice cream in that entire bin and what the flavor will taste like. Okay, so that was a good representation. That was a sample of the whole population. So in the real world, basically, getting a, rep a good representation of the entire population is not that easy. We often in the real world have a large varied population that's not that easy. It's much more varied than the Ben and Jerry's tub. So when I say varied, think about the Ben and Jerry's tub. Think about it if it had vanilla and chocolate and strawberry and monkey, but you just got a sample of the vanilla. Well, that's not a good representation of the rest of that sample because it was very varied. You just got one small piece. So when we take a, um, when we take a sample, we have to make sure that it is representation of the entire population. So number one, in, before we start sampling, how do we sample well? Number one, we want to define the population that we want to describe. Okay, so if we are defining the population to be all students in Fairfax County, then we want to say exactly what we want to measure. That's called defining your variable. So we want to measure students GP, high school students' GPAs from the 7.30 start time to the 9 o'clock start time. That is very specific. And then we're going to go and take a sample survey. So what is that? It's a study that uses an organized plan that we think of ahead of time to choose a sample that's a good representation of the specific population. And then the last thing we want to do is decide how do we choose that sample from the population so that it is a good representation of the population. So, okay, that was one to check and see what the, 
if the grade point averages went up over you know a later start time. So what exactly do we need surveys for? Here's just like a good example. Um, each month the conference board takes a representation of 5,000 sample of 5,000 households and asks them five questions about their current business and employment conditions and about their expectations regarding business conditions, employment conditions, and total family income six months from the time of the survey. So for each question, there are three possible responses, positive, negative, or neutral. These are combined into an index that's calculated relative to the value of 100 in 1985. Okay, so 100 meant like awesome working conditions. So in July of 2013, it stood at 80.3. That was weak with respect to 1985 at 100, but in May, it stood at 63.3. So that was basically like saying that people in May of 2010 were not super satisfied with their job satisfaction. When we do a survey like this, we want to make sure that our sample is a good representation of all of the consumers as a whole. We wouldn't just want to have just people that have make over $200,000 a year in it. We wouldn't want to have just people that are working at fast food restaurants. We want to get a good idea of the entire population of job satisfaction. Okay, what is bias in sampling? So bias in sampling, basically what it is, is when you take a sample, it systematically favors certain outcomes. Well, what does that mean? Is that means is, let's just say that we are taking a survey of um, and I'll have this later on. Let's say we're taking a survey of how tall all male students are in Fairfax County. However, you decide to stand outside of the basketball game and you want, and you take all the sample of how tall those males are in that basketball game. Well, that's going to be bias because every time you do that, probably you're going to get males that are taller than everybody else. Okay. Now with bias, it means you're consistently overestimating or underestimating. It's not just one random person that's taller than everybody else. It's every time you do the survey, you're either your survey ends up with people that are too tall or people that are too short. This often comes from bad sampling, and that was the example that I used with the basketball games. So what unbiased sampling does is it still, when you take a sample, it will produce estimates that differ from the true population. So what's the true population male height in Fairfax County. Well, when I take a sample, I'm going to get people that are close to the true population or true height. I'm going to get people that are too short. I'm going to get people that are too tall. However, the estimates that I get from a good sample, some are going to be too tall, some are going to be too short, but they'll even each other out. So that means that they differ from the population simply by chance alone. When I say simply by chance alone, that means that when I go and look at the average height of everybody, obviously some people are going to be taller and some people are going to be shorter, but I'm not consistently getting people that are taller or consistently getting people that are shorter. Bias is the result of a bad study design, okay, and it consistently misses the truth. So every time I sample, I'm always getting males that are too tall, okay? Every single time. So how do how do we choose a sample that we can trust that's a good representation of the population? There are a couple of different methods to select sampling. One is a convenient sample. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's convenient. You choose people that are easy to reach. However, they often produce data that's unrepresentation, uh, unrepresentative of the entire population. Why? Well, it's not a good representation because it's usually easy. It's convenient. Let's say you like coffee and you want to know what proportion of your town likes coffee. So you sit at Starbucks. It's convenient. You like drinking coffee. And you take a sample of people that walk by and ask if they like coffee. Well, that's really convenient for you, but most likely you're going to get an overestimate of the proportion of people that like coffee because if they walk past Starbucks, maybe they're going to go in and get Starbucks. Now, what exactly is convenient sampling? When we talk about convenient sampling, you always want to state what direction it is going to be biased in. So let's say you want to know the study habits of people in your school. Go to the library, ask 30 students how many hours they study. Well, they're all in the library studying, so they must like to study. This is going to overestimate the amount of time that people spend on homework. Let's say you're at college and you want to know how many people play intramural sports. So you stand outside the gym and ask 25 students if they participate in intramural sports. 
this is going to overestimate the number of students that play intramural sports because you're asking people that actually play, not anybody else. Okay. Um, another convenient sample would be, let's say you want to know the percentage of students that bike to school. So you stand in the school parking lot, ask how many people bike to school. This is going to underestimate the number of students that bike to school because you're standing in the parking lot where people are driving. So just keep this in mind as you're designing your samples surveys.